Hi, it's Dr. Robert Weaver. I've so enjoyed doing these uh, videotapes and getting uh, comments back and forth. I'm a Harvard-trained neuropsychologist, and I'm the director and neuropsychologist at the Weaver Center in uh, Whalen, Massachusetts. And um, I've had um, a lots of experience <laughs> from the inside with dyslexia and attention and organization issues, self-esteem uh, struggles, and some emotional issues as a result of that. But mostly, it's been a benefit because of the struggles. So I've had a lot of good ideas about what people would like to hear about. And one that just keeps coming up and uh, often is what is neuropsychological testing? Why is it recommended at more and more public and private schools, um, elementary, middle school, high school, colleges, graduate schools, or in preparing one for a career? And so a neuropsychologist and a, and a neuropsychological evaluation is very specific in terms of evaluating both strengths and difficulties in the areas of attention, concentration, impulsivity, distractibility, uh, span of attention, focus of attention. There's many different areas that you can have strengths and or difficulties, high interest, low interest, rapid processing, uh, not rapid processing. Another whole area is executive function. That's organization, organizing, planning, following through, assessing how you're doing, and what kind of speed that you're likely to do that. Just one of my alarms going off, because that's what I use. Um, and so all of the organizational pieces that have to do with how we process things over time. Attentional things are mostly how we process things in the moment. We also do a lot of evaluation of processing speed. People can be very bright and capable but have difficulties in processing auditory or visual information or integration of information or gestalts of information. So it's very important to get a, a sense of someone's abstract thinking and concrete and sequential thinking. So that's very important, especially as it has to do with processing um, speed. Uh, speech and language issues are often evaluated in terms of expressive language and receptive language and how organization may hinder or support different areas of uh, being able to be productive. So there's a lot of things in terms of how one processes these things that are aside from intellect, which is all, always done with a neuropsychological evaluation because we need to know what the, the, what the strengths and liabilities profile of someone's intellectual functioning is relative to how someone does in each of these areas of attention organization, processing speed, language, and sometimes fine motor if that's um, you know an issue. So what are the questions that one asks? Because there's just briefly, there's other types of evaluations. We like to do comprehensive evaluations when they're warranted, but that has to do with what's called projective testing, which is just social and emotional testing. What's going on inside, we like to say sometimes kind of under the emotional hood. You know, again, strengths and liabilities is very important to, uh, to ask about. Educational testing in terms of reading, writing, spelling, math, but also reading comprehension, writing skills, not only the details of writing, but how it organizes and expresses themselves um, with academic abilities. We do study skills evaluation. How do you approach studying? What works for you? Is it active? Is it passive? Again, there's different kinds of, there's also speech and language when there's more articulate, not articulation only, but also higher functioning processing of language uh, in terms of uh, receptive and expressive language. So what are some questions that one might ask? Because um, mostly folks, when they are asking for a neuropsychological evaluation, it's important to say, what do you include? To see whether they might include in their pricing, um, intellectual testing, educational, social and emotional, speech and language, or primarily the neuropsychological evaluation. Secondly, you want to know, of course, whether uh, insurance is likely to cover, because generally insurances are getting more and more restrictive with regard to the time that they allow clinicians to work. 
so, on evaluation. So another good thing is to say, in what ways are you restricted in terms of using the insurance that we have? What types of time does it take to do evaluations? We here at the Weaver Center have always been a major high quality place so that we utilize insurances when they're appropriate for being um, out of uh, network because I really haven't wanted to restrict our time and so if a kid comes and they're not feeling that great, we, you know, we're not trying to pack in time here. But it's very important because we have an opportunity to look at the answers that kids give us or the, how they solve problems in terms of how they do it, not just whether they're successful or not, and just not just about the scores. Because if you find out how someone does something, you can be much more descriptive in your recommendations. So general neuropsychological testing should be at least four to six hours. Uh, education will be three to five hours, generally speaking. Projective testing can be three to four hours. Study skills is an hour or two, and that's included. Um, and also it's important to say, so what are the component parts? How much of a history do you do? Uh, what kind of a history do you do? What do you, what do you include in the observations? When we get down to the summary, how thorough is the summary relative to a lot of data? Are your reports readable? Is there a way I could get a copy of a report with all of the names redacted um, you know, to, to see the quality of the evaluation that I'm likely to get? Um, certainly having referrals is very important. But the, among the, and then you, uh, it's important to say, what do you do for diagnosis? Because if insurance is gonna be needed, or used, then it needs to have a diagnostic category. Specifically, attention deficit is one of the most common diagnoses that we find is, is generally covered by, by PPOs or um, extended, uh, extensive um, uh, insurance plans. But it's also very important to ask about what are the recommendations? How do you organize your recommendations? Are they readable? Are they un easily understandable? Are they descriptive? Um, are they uh, done in areas in terms of what would be useful or important or critical at school for direct services and also accommodations? What types of study and organizational skills will be required because of organizational issues? The, um, what types of uh, uh, anxiety or apprehension or other things that might facilitate learning under some circumstance, but also interfere with uh, learning in other circumstances? Are there family recommendations? Are there individual counseling or emotional or social recommendations? How do you evaluate self-confidence and self-esteem? Uh, so these are some questions that you can that you uh, need to be able to ask, not just uh, someone that answers the phone, but you just say, I'd like to talk with the clinician that's uh, doing the work with my son or daughter, because we want to not only get the areas that there are suspected needs of, but we want to also know how much are the strengths evaluated, and more importantly, how much of the strengths are used in the recommendations to compensate for areas of difficulty. This is something that's not always included, but it's a very good thing to ask uh, questions about. Um, so um, the other question might be, if uh, they do, if the person or, or organization does take insurance, um, and I might have mentioned this earlier, but to say, to what degree does that restrict the available time that you have in, with my daughter and so on and so forth? And then finally, it's very important to find out whether the person that's doing the, um, the evaluation is able to come to school or to a community activity or someplace where there's been notice of some difficulty to be able to follow through and be an advocate for the student. Again, could be a graduate student or it could be a, you know, a younger student or an adult even, but to what degree is there follow-up? how involved and engaged and what's the, the, um, the way in which they do follow-up. For example, we say we, we specialize in follow-up. That's because we go to places, but really the specialty in follow-up is anytime you go to an organization or to a school 
make sure that once the agreements are made about what to do and how to use the material and so on and so forth, is to say, we'd like to set up a meeting in four or six weeks just to see how this goes. And when everyone's in, uh, accountable, including us and the parents and the kid and the, you know, or the school system, um, then we know that what we agreed on is likely to be put in place. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, we can go much more into detail with uh, social, emotional, and educational and study skills and speech and language evaluations another time. But I hope this is helpful in knowing that the, the amount of time that someone is able to spend not only with your, your child or your adult, but also what the re recommendations are and what the reports are like and how much follow-up they do will give you a good sense about evaluating the person that uh, your son or daughter or yourself is spending this amount of time with. Excellent. Thanks again for all of the suggestions and don't hesitate to see the other videotapes at our website, www.weavercenter.org. Thank you.